Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome listeners from around the world. This is your host, Jason Hartman. And this is episode number 680. All of you regular listeners know that that means this is a 10th episode show, a 10th episode where we go off topic. We don't talk too much about real estate or investing. We talk about something of general life interest. And we've got a fantastic guest for you today, Alan Zimmerman, talking about pivot and how one simple turn in attitude can lead to big success. I think you'll enjoy this interview and we'll be with that in a moment. Let's talk about, well, two real estate related things here just for a moment. Number one, we have our Ohio property tour coming up. Cincinnati, Ohio, Cincinnati, Dayton kind of metro area. And there is an article that I saw the other day in Newser about the 10 best cities for new college graduates. And it says, hello, Cincinnati. Hello, Cincinnati. Cincinnati, Ohio was number one. That was the number one of the 10 best cities for new college graduates. It says this year's new college graduates might want to give Ohio a closer look as a place to land. The state has two of the top three cities in a list by Smart Asset of the best places for new grads. The list looks at three big factors, jobs, affordability, and things to do. The top 10 are number one, Cincinnati, Ohio. Number two, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Number three, Columbus, another one of our markets. I haven't been so busy there lately, but we've done a lot of business in Columbus over the years. Number four, Kansas City, another market. Five, San Antonio. Six, Austin. Problem with Austin. It's a little too expensive for investors uh, at the moment. Seven, another one too expensive, Seattle, Washington. Eight, Omaha, Nebraska. Nine, Madison, Wisconsin, also expensive. And Wichita, Canvas. Can- Canvas. <laughs> that is Kansas, folks, not Canvas. <laughs> oh, boy. You know... You really deserve a professional broadcaster, don't you? (laughs) Just kidding. Well, I'm semi-professional. Hey, look, about 3,000 episodes out there now where I complain about everything and am critical of everybody. But yeah, this report, pretty cool. So Cincinnati, Ohio, number one. I hope you are joining us for our property tour coming up. uh, Well, that's just this weekend. So hope to see you there. And another thing, you know, you've seen articles about this over the years. Maybe you've seen things about it surfing on eBay or uh, just looking at the news media in general. Well, two of these, two of these I saw within one day of each other, and that is a whole town, a little city for sale. Now, this concept has always fascinated me because wouldn't it be neat to have this little monopoly of a real estate market, right? Where you could buy the whole town. And there are two examples currently in the news. There's one back east. I believe it's in, I don't know, where was that? Virginia or something like that. This one I'll tell you about is in Nevada. And it's just 80 miles south of Las Vegas. You can buy this for 8 million bucks, okay? $8 million. And it's complete with a casino, a bar, an airstrip, and 
about 375 residents. Yes, this is another Newser article. Michael Hawthorne goes on to say, uh, and, no, this is, this is interesting because um, the comparison, number one, he makes to San Francisco, and number two, the story he tells you about it. And I'm going to have a question for you toward the end of this because I just don't understand it. How, you know, help me understand this, listeners. Okay, so here's the article. Basically, just paraphrasing, it says, a couple hundred miles from San Francisco, where it seems like $8 million will get you a dilapidated one-bedroom condo. (laughs) That amount of money can buy you an entire town. Uh, CBS News reports that Nancy Kidwell is selling the Nevada town she founded back in 1951. Her first husband, get this, the guy's name is Slim. (laughs) With her first husband, Slim, it's called Kel Navari. Okay, that's like three words with hyphens. Cal, Nev, like California, Nevada, Ari. Lies 80 miles south of Las Vegas and boasts 375 or so residents, a hotel, a general store, a casino, and even a few stop signs. Even a few stop signs. Uh, It may look bland and boring, but it's pretty cool, says one 12-year-old resident. (laughs) That's so funny. A 12-year-old. They they couldn't get a comment from an adult resident? I mean, what does that mean? They quote the 12-year-old. Kidwell got the land from the federal government when it was nothing but an old World War II airstrip. She and Slim built it up from nothing. And when Slim died, now this is a funny story, folks. You listening? When Slim died in 1983 of Alzheimer's, I mean, that's not funny. Sorry, Slim. No no disrespect to you. He was 34 years her senior, according to AFP. Then, now this is the funny part. She married his son, Ace, and kept going. Now, isn't that like Woody Allen having a little tryst with Mia Farrow's daughter. Same thing, but uh, I don't know. The media was very critical of him, yet, I don't know. No one's critical of her, probably, right? I don't think her daughter was a minor, so that's why I'm saying that. If she was, then, of course, you know, definitely not appropriate, of course, and illegal. Go to jail, Woody. But I don't remember that story very well. Anyway, So she marries the guy's son, right? After her husband dies, she marries his son. And Slim has a son named, well, none other than Ace, of course, Ace. And five years after Ace's death, now this woman keeps outliving everybody, right? So now the son has passed away too, also of Alzheimer's. Kidwell is the town's, get this, she's the town's mayor and police chief. And she makes sure there's water in the tank every day. Is that an expression, or does that mean there's actually like a water tank that she's got to make sure she fills up? I'm not sure. She orders provisions for the cafe and does just about everything else. But at 78 years old, it's time to retire. Quote, I'm selling because I'm not getting any younger, Kidwell tells CBS. There's no one to take my place. I have to start providing for the future of the community. Calnev Air is listed on bizbuysell.com and there's already a handful of interested buyers. One wants to build an automobile test tract. Another wants to open a I told you this story was funny a marijuana resort. (laughs) What exactly is a marijuana resort by the way listeners is that a resort where everybody just gets stoned they live in a big commune and they all laugh and fall asleep and eat a lot? (laughs) You can't you can't make this stuff up. This article is just too funny, right? But there's one catch to the sale, okay? There's a condition, right? The cemetery where Ace and Slim are buried and where Nancy also has a plot must remain. When your roots are somewhere, that's where you want to be, she says. She tells CBS. So anyway, what I find interesting about this, and maybe some listeners can vox me on Voxer at jhart88 and edumacate me please, because I don't get it. When you own a town, what do you really own? Does she own, well, I guess she owns the hotel, the general store. I mean, a town doesn't necessarily own the real estate. I looked on Biz Buy Sell, and this is a 520-acre town, and it doesn't allow the 
quote, owner, unquote. I mean, does she own every piece of real estate in the town and she leases the the property to the person who runs the hotel, for example? I just don't get it. I don't really understand what the deal is. And it doesn't mean you get to make yourself king. I mean, she's the mayor and the police chief. Well, we still, the town is still in the United States. There's still theoretically democratic process, right? There must be voting. Uh, I, I don't know. I just don't, I kind of don't get it. When you buy a town doesn't mean you buy the government, right? I don't know. Educate me. Tell me. I don't get it. But I wanted to say, this idea is so intriguing. And I've seen a couple of these come up over the years. And I saw my friend uh, Corey post one on Facebook this morning talking about a place back east. Like I said, I think it was in Virginia. That one's a million bucks. I think it's an old military base or something. But this idea is darn intriguing. Maybe our Venture Alliance members would get a little syndicate together and we'll raise some money and we'll buy one of these towns. I don't know. It's just just an interesting idea. So kind of a fascinating real estate story there just for fun. Uh, Maybe seriously, of course, we would have to go to jasonhartman.com and we would have to watch that great little video that all of you need to watch. One of our listeners voxed me about this yesterday, and it's a great place to start. Right on the front page of jasonhartman.com is a fantastic little video, 27 minutes long, about how to analyze a real estate deal. We would have to do that for the town. We would have to know the income it produces, the rent to value ratio, all of the metrics. What is the, you know, how could you finance that town? Maybe you could finance it. I don't know. It's just an interesting idea, you know? So more on that uh, as the story develops, maybe a, a few episodes from now, we'll actually find out what it's sold for. Or a bunch of you will vox me on Voxer at jhart88, and you will say, hey, Jason, I want to put in a million bucks, and a few others of you will say you all want to put in a million bucks each, and I'll put in a million bucks, and hey, maybe we'll buy the town. We'll make it a real estate paradise, not a marijuana resort, okay? Because that doesn't sound too productive. All right. Well, hey, go to jasonartman.com. Check out the great properties there. I just purchased two more in Memphis myself, and we're battling the inventory problem, folks. It is challenging to get good inventory. If we wanted to sell our soul, we could uh, provide a lot more inventory, but we just do not want to sell junk. So check out the good properties we have at jasonhartman.com in the properties section. Also, be sure you check out hartmaneducation.com for some of our great educational resources. Again, today's the 10th episode. We'll be back on Wednesday with a regular episode where we dive deep into how to be a better real estate investor. All right, let's jump over to our guest and talk about pivot and attitude. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Alan Zimmerman to the show. He is an internationally recognized motivational speaker for business, helping people to maximize their payoffs. He's the author of the bestseller, Pivot, How One Simple Turn in Attitude Can Lead to Success, and also author of the new book, The Payoff Principle, Discover the Three Secrets for Getting What You Want Out of Life and Work. Alan, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great, Jason. Glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have you here. And before we started recording, I kind of misquoted Earl Nightingale, but I just remember as I'm talking to you, you know, that the incredible importance of this topic. And when I was 17 years old and discovered Earl Nightingale, I remember him saying to ask the role of attitude in one's success is like asking what the role of H2O is in the (laughs) Pacific Ocean. (laughs) Well said. This is vitally, vitally important to every aspect of life, isn't it? Well, the strange thing is we've done tons of research for years on this at universities, etc. And it comes down to something very simple. Almost always good attitudes lead to good results and bad attitudes lead to bad results. Yeah, it's pretty hard to escape that. You know, maybe there will be a lucky exception once in a while, but uh, 99% of the time I would say you you, you got to be right about that. So what can we do to control our attitudes? Uh, is, is it under our control? Well, absolutely. When people say, I can't help the way I feel or I've always been this way, it's really a lie. They may not know how to change the attitude, but it's changeable and controllable. The first thing I recommend is to act as if. It's an old psychological trick, but has a lot of power. In other words, if you wait until you feel positive, you'll wait forever. You have to start acting that way. 
behave confidently, have an upbeat tone to your voice. Actions always precede feelings. Interesting, yeah. So so that, that feedback loop, it is a circle, but we can jump in in that circle and create feelings. It's not like feelings are just, you know, some random uh, circumstance. They're created. They're created by us, right? Yeah, we have a lot of control that people don't realize. One of the things that we can do to become more of an actor instead of a reactor is to see something positive in every situation. Uh, not everything is good. Not everything is easy. Not everything is positive. But there's always something positive there. It may be a chance to meet somebody else. Learn a lesson from that presentation. Uh, feedback that will make me better at my next sales attempt. To see something positive in all situations. And what I find is that those who struggle, those who have the poorest attitude, when they fail, they use it as an excuse to give up. But those who really win use failure as a lesson for the next step. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit about sales. And I just want to say to the audience that we are all in sales. <laughs> you know, we're always trying to sell an idea, whether it's what movie are we going to see tonight or where are we going to go for dinner <laughs> versus uh, something more important like actually being in business and in the business of sales. So we're all in the sales business. I, I think that that's uh, important to, to understand as a, uh, as a context for what we're going to talk about. But what are some of the sales formulas that you recommend to people to be really, really exceptional? I use a formula that I call purpose plus passion plus process equals payoff. And the thing I find wrong in a lot of the research, a lot of the books on sales, on success, is they focus on one of those elements. They may focus on purpose, for example, and they'll say to have a purpose-driven life. Well, certainly that's true, but we all know folks who have a great sense of purpose don't have much to show for it. The second part, the passion, that's the attitude. And we hear about things such as attitude is everything. Eh, not quite true. A big part of success, but not everything. We all know folks who have a great attitude. But when it comes to get, getting results, they leave a lot to be desired. And the third element, process, that's the sales skills, the things you do. We have all three of those things in place, in good shape. Purpose passion process, you get amazingly good payoffs. I, I like that. It's easy to remember, you know, the three P's, uh, purpose, passion, and pro is that what you said, process? Yeah, process, exactly. So let's kind of drill down on those if we could, Alan, you know, maybe go into a little more detail on each of those three. Yeah. The first one is purpose. It's as simple as thinking, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. What's your purpose? Why are you here on earth? What are you trying to achieve? What's your goal? What's your dream? And it's a word that people use, but don't often figure out what their purpose is. And so I use a three-legged stool. Each leg in the stool represents a key question you have to ask yourself. When you get an answer to each question, you get the platform of the stool, which is your purpose. The first leg asks the question, what are you good at? We've all got talents, abilities. Write them down. Spend two, three days if you need to. But get the longest list possible. What are you good at? Second leg, and that is what excites you? What turns you on? What gets your motivational juices pumped up? Got to know what excites you. And, and thirdly, what difference do you want to make? Maybe it is in your industry, with your clients, with your family, in the world, your church, whatever. When you know those three answers, you get a clear purpose. And that's a driving force for the other two steps of the process. So first of all, there's the purpose. Once you've got a purpose figured out, some call it goals, some call it dreams, I simply call it purpose. The second element, the passion, that has three elements as well. <clears throat> In terms of the passion, part of that is attitude. I look at a fire, and for a fire to be effective, it needs three things. The fire needs some fuel. Maybe it's wood. Maybe it's coal. Needs some fuel. That particular fuel I call attitude. It's part of the passion. But to keep on burning, that fire needs oxygen. It needs persistence. It also needs a fire ring. Otherwise, it gets out of control. And that guidance, that fire ring is character. With 
attitude, persistence, and character. You get a fire that burns hot. You got the passion. That's the second element. I, I really like that firing uh, metaphor. That's a, that's a good one. I've never heard that before because passion uncontrolled uh, is just reckless, isn't it? Watch any news program. You'll see exactly what happens without a character or firing. And the last one is process. And that is, what are the skills to accomplish what you want to achieve? And I talk about four sets of skills. Two of them are personal skills. One is the whole idea of affirmations, programming your mind for success. You can put the right kinds of thoughts in to get the right results out. Part of that is avoiding mind binders. People saying, I can't close a sale. I can't prospect. I'm no good at giving a presentation. I can't do such and such. As long as they think that way, they will not have success. You need to get some positive affirmations in your mind. That's one process. Another process is continuing education. You can't expect to be better at sales or anything else without continual education. And one of the big mistakes people make is thinking that yesterday's skills are enough for tomorrow's expectations. Not true. There's also two interpersonal skills in this process, and that is what I call connective communication and compassionate listening. How do I connect with other people so they want to hear me, take me seriously, we have mutual respect, and to give me their willing cooperation? But also, how do I listen so I understand their needs so I can meet those needs? Those four processes are key. Yeah, interesting. Really, really interesting stuff. You know, it, see, we can all control the process, can't we? So all we really need to do is just ask ourselves in any given situation, you know, if we're feeling down, if we're feeling bad about the world, uh, bad about ourselves, bad about our lives, whatever, we can just ask ourselves, have we done the things in the process? The process is completely under our control, right? Yeah, so much the case. I'll hear people say to me, I gave it my all. I gave 100% to some project, and they're still failing. When I coach them, I interview them more carefully. Maybe it's a salesperson. They'll say, I sent out a 1,000 emails and get any, any response. And they call that 100% effort. And I would say, no, 100% effort might be doing more than other salespeople. It's researching your product more deeply, coming early, staying late, making more phone calls, sending more notes, asking for more referrals, going to more classes. It's doing a lot more, so that would be 100% effort. Those are under our control. Talk about this from both sides, and let's talk about the work environment for a moment, if we can. How does this apply to business owners or managers in, in a corporate environment and employees in terms of uh, employees who think, I don't like it here, I, I want to leave, I want to quit my job. Should they be thinking of some of these processes you mentioned and the, or the three Ps? And, you know, what should managers do with, with that when they face various frustrations and challenges? You made a good comment at the beginning, Jason, about everybody being a salesperson. And that's true, whether you're selling to your spouse, to your customers, to your colleagues. And if that's the case, people don't realize the power of persistent communication, asking for what you need. Uh, for example, research tells us that 92% of salespeople give up after the fourth call or fourth no. And yet 60% of people who buy, buy after saying no four times. What that tells me, the majority of sales, most of the business goes to a minority of folks who are persistent enough to keep at it. So part of what I would suggest is to learn how to ask for what you need. It's a powerful skill. How do you phrase it? So they are willing to say, yes, I'll listen, I'll follow, I'll get on board. Okay, so, so there is a, a technique in terms of the way you ask, how you phrase it, rather than just asking. I mean, asking is better than nothing, I would guess, <laughs> because, you know, you've got to at least ask, right? But what's that technique? Distill that a little bit for us, if you would. In a very succinct fashion, it has three parts. Will you, when you do, if you don't? Will you uh, be at the meeting at 8 o'clock sharp? You're specific, you're positive, you're firm, you're expecting a positive response. The second part, when you. When you do what I'm asking, what's the positive consequence? For example, you ask your kids to do something, they always say, well, why, why? Well, all adults are are <laughs> big kids. Children. They're big kids. <laughs> They're children in big bodies, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Adults think the same way. Why? Well, when you come to the meeting at 8 o'clock, 
will finish by 9 o'clock. I can assure you of that. When you give out that presentation, we have a better chance of keeping that account. And the third part, if you don't do it, I'm asking, what's the possible negative consequence? Not meant to be a threat, simply the big picture. If we don't do certain things, we lose customers, lose time, energy, momentum. When you put those three elements together, you increase dramatically the chance of getting a yes. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, that's it's good formula, good formula. I want to ask you, well, just maybe finish up on the employer-employee relationship, if you would, because I want to ask you about one of your particularly interesting blog posts about happiness. I really enjoyed this one. But more comments on the uh, employer-employee relationship? Well, one of the things that people sometimes don't realize that it is a relationship. I don't take that word lightly. People spend more time with their coworkers, their bosses, their customers. They do their, oftentimes their aunts, uncles, kids, spouses. We spend so much time with them. And so not attending to the relationship, not working on making it better is rather foolish. I would say there's three, four things you have to do. One is respect. It's non-negotiable. doesn't mean you agree with people, but you must communicate respect to build a relationship. Secondly, keep them informed. Uh, This old idea of no news is good news might sound catchy, but it doesn't work. People want to know as much as possible. Thirdly, and that is uh, tangibles. What do they get out of the relationship? Maybe it is your attention, a better chance of serving a customer, a, a promotion. There's something tangible they get out of that. So respect, keeping informed, something tangible. And it may sound silly, But there's an element of fun in a relationship. It's not grim, gloom, and doom. It's fun working with, communicating with the other person. Absolutely. Okay, good. So let's talk about happiness for a moment, if we can now. Attitude obviously plays a huge role in this. But you you have an interesting blog post, and it's entitled, Is Happiness a Dangerous Goal? And so I want to ask you about that. But one of the parts that I, I just love here is the way you help people practice the attitude of gratitude and, uh, and and how you turn, you know, every lemon into lemonade. You know, it's just awesome the way you did that in here. Is happiness a dangerous goal? It's an interesting, <laughs> compelling title. I've surveyed thousands of people and I ask, what do you want out of life? And by far the number one answer is people say, I just want to be happy. Well, that's fine. But what is it? If you don't know what it is, it's very hard to achieve it. And happiness is a little dangerous because it is determined by something else happening first, and then I'll be happy. It makes you a victim instead of a creator of circumstances. It's not a choice you make. It's a result you get. So it disempowers you. So I think happiness is nice to have, certainly not against it, but it's a little bit dangerous to seek that as the goal. So what should we be seeking as the goal then? Well, you may, I, I like the word joy because that's a choice. I can choose to be joyful, even though I may have some pain in my life, have some difficulties, and we all do. It's a choice I make. Attitude is not something somebody gives you. It's part of the choice you make, and you can choose to be joyful or positive. And one of the ways you can choose to be joyful and encourage the happiness to take place is practice that attitude of gratitude. As you mentioned in my blog post on that, one simple thing. I tell people, take a walk outside, find a nice day, walk by yourself, and outside say a thousand times out loud, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you a thousand times. And what will happen when something negative comes into your life? Something you're grateful for will pop back into your mind and neutralize that negativity. You can literally practice an attitude of gratitude until it becomes a part of who you are. Yeah, it it really does. But I think the reframing that you talk about in your blog post is is really excellent. I'll just share some of the the examples of that. I'm thankful for, and then you know the the teenager who's not doing the dishes but is watching TV because that means he is home and not out on the streets. Okay, 
<laughs> you know? And, he, and here's one. I remember many years ago now, I, I have since canceled this goal that I'm about to share with you. But many years ago in my early 20s, I remember thinking I, I was starting out in my uh, real estate career back then, and I was making a lot of money. And I, I remember I paid the IRS about $140,000 that year. And I actually took the check and I stuck it on my wall. And I thought my goal is to pay the IRS a million dollars a year because that means I'll make about four million, right? And um, uh, well, not so much anymore, but <laughs> the tax rates are higher. But I've since canceled that goal because I know there are ways to get around those big taxes and still make a lot of money by owning properties. But what's interesting here is you say, you know, I'm thankful for the taxes I pay because it means I'm employed. Look, they don't take money, they don't take part of money you don't earn, right? So that that is, you know, these reframes are really good. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit it a little too snug because that it means that I have enough to eat, right? Looking at the bright side, reframing things. Of course, one of the most famous reframes ever is probably the Reagan-Mondale debates where Mondale called Reagan out on his age, and Reagan famously said, I will not make my opponent's youth and inexperience an issue in this campaign. <laughs> he just won everybody over with that. But It was classic, and it turned the election. It did. It probably did. That one statement probably did. But... I, I mean, these reframes are great. Do you want to share any others? Well, I think you mentioned quite a few there. There's, there's a whole list yeah. of them here. Yeah. There's a whole list, you know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thankful. I, I, and finally, I'm thankful for too much email because it means I have friends, or really it should be people, business people maybe, who are thinking of me, right? <laughs> yeah, you can reframe. There's always something positive there. One person that I learned a great deal from, a colleague of mine, happened to be one of the Iran hostages when we had that situation years ago, they were locked up for 444 days. And he came back and said that was the greatest experience of his lifetime. And I thought, what? And he said he found out it was great because when he got back to American soil, he realized that he could make it through a tough situation, that it didn't matter if he went bankrupt or not. He could always start over, that he had what it took to get through challenges. It changed his whole way of thinking. And it happened to me a bit later during the Khmer Rouge killings in Laos and Cambodia. I was working with the refugees that were escaping to the refugee camps in Thailand. And I listened to them talk about their situations of despair and escape and came back to my home and realized I had kids who were complaining about having to unload the dishwasher. Like that was a major task in life. To let them know that some folks don't have dishes, let alone dishwashers, let alone food, to cut the griping and start the appreciating. I began working literally on those reframes that you've talked about. You can always find something positive. Look for that, and you'll do so much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it definitely is. Well, Alan, give out your website. Tell people where they can find out more and find the books. Well, thank you, yes. My website is simply drzimmerman.com. That's D-R-Z-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N, drzimmerman.com. And there's several things you can find there. My newest book is The Payoff Principle, Discover All Three Secrets, lead to success. You'll also find my uh, blog, my newsletter. I've got a large subscription of people getting my weekly blogs as you just received mine today. Feel free to sign up for that. Love to have you part of that. Again, drzimmerman.com. Good. Dr. Alan Zimmerman, thank you so much for joining us. It was my pleasure, Jason. Great, great day for all of you. I've never really thought of Jason as subversive, but I just found out that's what Wall Street considers him to be. Really? Now, how is that possible at all? Simple. Wall Street believes that real estate investors are dangerous to their schemes because the dirty truth about income property is that it actually works in real life. I know. I mean, how many people do you know, not including insiders, who created wealth with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds? Those options are for people who only want to pretend they're getting ahead. Stocks and other non-direct traded assets are a losing game for most people. The typical scenario is... You make a little, you lose a little, and spin your wheels for decades. That's because the corporate crooks running the stock and bond investing game will always see to it that they win. This means, unless you're one of them, you will not win. And unluckily for Wall Street, Jason has a unique ability to make the everyday person understand investing the way it should be. 
He shows them a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Yep, and that's why Jason offers a one-book set on creating wealth that comes with 20 digital download audios. He shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets, untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches you how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And this set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered for only $197. To get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia Book 1, complete with over 20 hours of audio, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.